Saga Cigars, makers of the Saga Golden Age. The Golden Age is a cigar that takes you back to the classic days of cigar smoking. Through the six generations of experience by the Reyes family, the Saga Golden Age delivers a timeless blend that uses the nobility of the tobacco to bring you the perfect balance of power and flavor. It narrates better than words the history of a family's tradition in tobacco, delivering a cigar much like the ones they used to smoke in the times of Hemingway. Saga Golden Age is a full-bodied, full-flavored Dominican Puro. With tobaccos from one farm, the blend features a Corojo 2006 wrapper and filler from original Cuban seeds grown in the Dominican Republic. Available in four sizes at an affordable price, the Saga Golden Age is sure to please and take you back on a journey to yesteryear. Welcome back, everyone, to the Stogie Geek Show. This is our four-year anniversary episode. We're doing an all-day podcast and show for Cigar Rights of America. Make sure you go to CigarRights.org. Use Will's ambassador number, which is... 0159. 0159. Sign up. Renew. Everyone that smokes cigars should do it. And I'm sure the man we have on the lines via Skype would agree... The president of CRA, Glenn Loop, is here with us. Welcome, Glenn. Great to be with you guys. Thank Great you. to have you. Congratulations as on your anniversary show. Thank you, thank you. We hope to be doing it uh, well into the future. So we hope, uh, and we hope the CRA can can yep. help us uh, to lobby support so that uh, we can have cigar rights and continue to do shows like this. Yep. Well, advertising and marketing restrictions are going to be the next round of regulation. Assure you, so we're, you'll be in the crosshairs too. We're already feeling it, Glenn. Yeah, we already um, – so on pretty much every major um, social media outlet uh, and even website technologies, we've felt it. Um, we're not allowed to run ads on YouTube. Uh, we've been denied running ads on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, and Squarespace only partners with one credit card merchant uh, – credit card provider, rather, I should say. And they do not allow sales of tobacco. So we've seen that across – uh, the technology sector. Now, the one company that do, is standing behind people's rights to have free content is Apple. I mean, we're able to Apple. distribute our podcast in the Apple yep. store, and several podcasts are out there that are on the subject of cigars. God forbid that would happen. That would completely destroy us. So um, I know your job is to fight on the government side, but our struggle recently, Glenn, has centered around a lot of these private companies' regulations around tobacco because they all hate tobacco because it's the thing to hate right now. Is that is that an accurate assessment? Well, it is. And, you know, our brethren in the firearms industry know this as well as anybody, but mm-hmm. they happen to have the Constitution on their side, as right. they're fond of mentioning, in the form of that Second Amendment. Well, I've been pondering that question a little deeper of late. And, and I'm starting to really believe we need to launch, and I'm, I've actually made notes about this, so maybe we're doing this as a breaking news thing on Stogie Geeks, but um, I think we need to launch a freedom of assembly project um, that, that these types of measures, not necessarily in the advertising and marketing arena, but in terms of smoking bans and property rights. You know, I've said for a long time, the smoking bans are the largest seizure of private property rights in the history of America. Um, the laws that are on the books to protect us at bars and restaurants are to protect us from what we don't know, how food is prepared, the cleanliness of the facility, those types of things. If you know that smoking is allowed in a, in a facility, what's the, what's the big deal? And it is private property. It is private property. Mm-hmm. Not, and our opposition has done a magical job of convincing a lot in the political community that that's public property. And uh, anyway, I'm, I'm getting off on a, on a tangent here, but I do believe that there are certain measures that have been taken that infringe upon our ability to have freedom of assembly, which is protected under the Constitution. And I think some of the things you just highlighted indicate how we are, are being hindered in terms of our freedom of speech. Yeah. So I, maybe, I, I, maybe I we agree. do have the uh, I agree it's a freedom of speech. I, I'm almost willing to say, okay, if you don't want me to let me run ads, that's, you know, I, I, that's a tough one to argue, right, being able to run ads. Um, but being able to put my content and have freedom of speech – is the larger issue and right. the one that concerns us much, you know, in a, in a much greater fashion. We want to have a presence on Facebook. We want to have a presence on Twitter. We want to have a YouTube channel. We want to be able to put a podcast in the store just like everyone else can because this is a legal 
product. We're not advertising right. it towards towards minors. Um, so I, I think we should have that right, and I feel like we need to do everything we can to help protect that. Glenn, just consider if Facebook went away tomorrow for the cigar industry. If they said no more tobacco companies can have pages on there, what a, an effect it would have on this cigar business. It would be catastrophic. Well, you know as well as I do. Especially our, our friends in the more the boutique arena. Yeah. Yeah. The social media sphere has been the greatest venue possible to spread the message as to the, the availability of a given cigar, the uniqueness of a given cigar, um, to highlight entrepreneurs that are just coming into the business and to, to introduce their product to the cigar smoking public. So um, ab- absolutely, we would have to start the cigar book the next day. Yep, I agree. We'd help you with that. We would definitely. <laughs> we would definitely. We 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 talked about something. We we had a meeting about. Yeah, yeah we talked about that yesterday. Of contingencies, yeah, because it does it does keep uh, me awake at night right now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for us, we do have fun doing this show, but there is a business angle of it too. And in order to be able to produce, you know, what we're producing, we we do need, you know, to operate as a business. And and when our hands are getting strong, it, it's very difficult. Well, and I'm sure we'll get into this a, a little bit later, but I think this is indicative of also the circumstances that were just uh, confronted by the industry with the Federal Express decision not to deliver tobacco. Um, I never cease to be amazed by the creativity of our opposition. And I'm not saying FedEx is the opposition, but that was certainly, we were certainly an unintended consequence, collateral damage, if you will, of that uh, state court case in New York on the delivery of untaxed tobacco products. So all of a sudden there's a sweeping corporate decision made that we're not going to deliver any tobacco. So you know, those types of, of circumstances are just further tightening the noose on us and compelling us to get more creative as to how we deliver product, advertise a product, enjoy a product. And, and I, I think we'll be chatting about more uh, along those lines during the course of the show. Glenn, now with the battle, you know, being on Capitol Hill and certainly the FDA being a government organization, the government also obviously controls the U.S. Postal Service. What's the likelihood that these types of decisions not to deliver tobacco will translate into the U.S. Postal Service? I am glad you brought that up. (laughs) (laughs) Um, On literally the day that, uh, that the FedEx decision came down, uh, we made a, a series of, of significant calls, and, and the point you just brought up uh, became front and center, because it doesn't take a lot of imagination to consider that some of our opposition on Capitol Hill, maybe we shouldn't be saying this now because it could plant the thought, but let's just put the cards on the table. There are no state secrets anymore, as we all know. Um the Postal Service is under the domain of the House Government Oversight Committee, uh, Oversight and Government uh, Organization Committee, and uh, Government Reform Committee, excuse me. And the Oversight Committee has numerous, numerous members that are co-sponsors of our legislation on premium cigar exemption. So we do intend to be taking a proactive message to them to say, listen, in light of the FedEx decision, don't even think or even allow the discussion to come up that uh, that the U.S. Postal Service could be pulled into this type of a debate because I can see it happening. I can see somebody like you know some of our noted nemesis in, in the United States Congress, whether in the House or the Senate, try to get ever more creative. See, this is just another way to, to tighten the noose around tobacco as a whole, but obviously cigars specifically in terms of delivery. So we are going to take more of a proactive role in terms of messaging on that with, with Congress. But also we facilitated a very productive discussion with the United Parcel Service. And UPS has been a friend of this industry in Washington. Um, we hold meetings at their Capitol Hill office. They've got a wonderful cigar patio behind the UPS house that a lot of members of Congress utilize for, for cigar events. And uh, we confirmed with their legal department that they have no intention of changing their, their tobacco delivery policy. So that's, that's good news on that front. Well, and it was probably good news for them when FedEx came out with the decision. They were probably thrilled because yeah. that business is just going to translate right over to UPS. And well, it should. Mm. 
And from what I understand, UPS is there. They have better controls than FedEx did to begin with. On in terms of yeah, they do identify that they ship tobacco products, and they're able to identify with that a lot better. Yeah, I understand that there are good uh, protocols uh, for that type of thing, and and it goes back to just common sense. This industry doesn't sell its product to miners, and I think the message that came out yesterday on that is an absolute case in point. I don't know if you saw this. I I posted it. It was a article that was in the uh, uh, Hill political newspaper in Washington that the and then the FDA sent out a, a press release later yesterday afternoon about this very subject that they were putting on a pedestal a uh, a notice that eight retailers they were I think I got the impression principally convenience stores uh, that eight retailers had been issued a cease selling order meaning they could not sell tobacco products for the next 30 days, because they have been caught consistently selling to miners. So they put these eight on a sort of a national pedestal, if you will, of what you're not supposed to do. Well, they've conducted, and this was in the same article, they've conducted 508,000 inspections. The FDA, contracting with state and local health departments, they've conducted 508,000 compliance inspections on things like selling to miners and advertising and, and display restrictions and the like. And it, we, out of 508,000, we found eight to put on this platform. Of the 508,000 inspections, there's been a 95% compliance rate. Well, I posted up. You know, well, who in the federal government or who anywhere does anything with 95% efficiency? And I think that's what makes this whole notion of youth access to, to, to tobacco a, a total misnomer. And, I know, and I'm glad, so glad, Glenn, that you're coming up with hard evidence to prove that yep. because we all say it and I think of it when I go to an event with Jose Blanco and going into a cigar shop they don't even serve liquor in this cigar shop but it's grown adults sitting around talking about tobacco smoking cigars there's no minors involved in in this process in this hobby I and mean, a large portion of this hobby now I can say that but Glenn having the evidence is just it's so awesome that's their number that came straight from the FDA's own website. 508,000 inspections, 95% compliance. And I was at the National Association of Tobacco Outlets uh, conference and trade show in, in the spring, and, and Mitch Zeller with the FDA Center for Tobacco Products was standing up there in front of them. And the big deal was, well, what about that 5%? Well, okay, yes, we should all strive for that. But when you're talking about passing regulations that are going to impact basically 2,000 premium cigar shops, you realize what a fraction of a fraction we really are in this entire ballgame. And I dare say that when they do inspect, and they can inspect because you know tobacco shops sell all types of tobacco products, when they do conduct those inspections, we cannot find incidents where there's any meaningful infractions on behalf of, of premium cigar shops across this country. And that's, a, that's just the cardinal message. Our people are carding people. Uh, card check is a, is a staple of operating premium cigar shops across this country. You know, and what other industry has something like Tobacconist University, which teaches responsible retailing? Mm -hmm. And front and center of, to that is card check. So it's, it's, it's a complete fiction. Mm -hmm. I completely you know, agree. We were just talking a lot about tobacco in this university from, from the consumer end, but that's a really good that's point, a good point yeah. as well with the types of education that they provide. Who else certifies, not just the retailers, but we're getting ready to engage in a, in a uh, very exciting initiative with Jorge Armenteros and Tobacco this University on the certified consumer. You know, not to begrudge anybody else in the tobacco uh, arena, but you know, who else certifies their own patrons? And a, a cardinal piece of that is going to be responsible consumer, uh, you know, basic courtesy. I mean, I don't have to tell you guys. Is there any sector, whether you're talking about you know, drinking, smoking, whatever the case might be, I have found cigar consumers to be among the most courteous of anything in the country. When they're, when we used to be able to smoke in our in our local bar uh, here. It would be, does my cigar offend you? If not, if it does, I can move over here. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. Or going outside, and if you're around patrons that are not, you know, 
partaking in, in a cigar and the like. Will this offend you? I hear people say that all the time. Will this offend you? If so, I'll go over here. You know, you don't hear that a lot from other sectors, whatever the case might be. And and God knows when it comes to, you know, basic uh, courtesy, I, I think we depict that as a as a uh, as a coalition of cigar smokers across this country. Glenn, uh, I want to I want to talk about my trip to the dentist. Because it brings up some very interesting points, right? This very young hygienist, and, you know, she asked, well, do you smoke? And I said, yeah, you know, I smoke cigars. And she's like, well, and she kind of looked at me like I was the world's worst horrible person, right? So that's a good, good point to note as part of the story. And then she's like, well, how many packs do you smoke a day? I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's move beyond that. Um, but I think that there's this perception, and if you watch the advertisements, that, uh, anti-tobacco advertisements that come up on MTV, there's this real disconnect. Because the thing that got me was when she asked, after the line of questioning, she asked me, like, she's like, well, I said, well, I, I'm involved in the cigar industry. I said, I have a you know, cigar show, uh, TV show and podcast. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm in the cigar business. And she's like, oh, I've never heard of anyone that was in the cigar business before. Like, it doesn't dawn on the younger generation that there's an industry around responsible use yeah. of tobacco and that there are people's jobs and stores and factory and media and cigar print magazines and the factories in Miami right here in the U.S., as well as countless numbers of jobs um, in the Latin American countries. It doesn't dawn on them that there are people that put food on their table because of this industry and that, like what Glenn is saying, we're very responsible about it, unlike some of the other tobacco industries. Well, absolutely. And i tell you what kind of dramatizes that. I'm having a flashback. Um, I can remember the date. I can almost remember the time of day. But on April the 9th, 2009, we had our first industry-wide meeting in, in Miami uh, with all the manufacturers. And it was on that day, it was very prophetic, that Ernesto Corello uh, said the following. Maybe we should hire a few fewer lobbyists and hire a decent public relations firm. Mm. <laughs> and, you know, if, if for example, when you read that book, Velvet Glove, Iron Fist, on the history of the anti-smoking movement, you get three quarters of the way through it and you realize that if this industry had started to play the political game a little bit differently in the late 80s, early 90s, it'd be a very different ball game today and and rocky is fond of saying you know we're like wine or or single malt scotch and those industries don't find themselves under attack the way we do and you know perhaps if we do play the mainstream media uh, a little more clear a little more aggressively maybe you wouldn't have the experience like you did with your with your dental hygienist right uh, barry stein has been an advocate of that uh, from the very beginning and i'm i'd probably regretfully say that we find ourselves so much in constant crisis management mode that sometimes we neglect to be able to concentrate on strategies like that. But, you know, ever since the beginning of CRA, it's been one thing after another in terms of that constant political crisis management. I was on the job for three weeks. You know, since you guys are in Rhode Island, I, I'll bring this up. I was on the job for three weeks, and we ended up calling for the resignation of Mayor Tom Menino of Boston because of the unilateral move to sunset cigar bars and demand smoking on outdoor patios at places like some of the great steakhouses in Boston that had invested in, in uh, patios that you can enjoy a cigar during your meal. And so first three weeks on the job, you're calling for the resignation of the mayor of Boston. Hmm. And it evolves into there into what happens with S chip and then what happened with in late two mid two thousand nine with the with the passage of the Tobacco Control Act. And then since then, 35 smoking bans, 36 tax battles, state and local regulatory and tax and uh, regulatory tax and, and uh, uh, ban smoking ban measures that have had to be attacked one after another. And it showed really how far behind politically the industry is in terms of uh, being able to take a proactive step towards against those types of measures. And I know that's the brilliance and, uh, and the impetus behind why these guys started CRE in the very first place. But it also shows how far behind we have been politically. So hopefully now, seven years into it, we can say we're getting to the stage where we can have some more of those types of proactive measures like a solid public relations campaign. 
Um, God knows it's, that's what's gotten us this far in Washington. And we'll talk about that in a second. But I think the political education uh, program that we've initiated with Congress over the last three years specifically has allowed us to get to where we are in terms of messaging, at least in that city. Now it's time to take it to every state capital in the country. Very, very, very key. Yeah, I agree. In yeah, education. You know, I, I understand the, the struggle, Glenn. You have to fight the battle on the hill. Um, once we get a good foothold there, it sounds like what you're saying is then we can do some public campaigning to uh, help change the perception uh, of, of smoking in, in the industry. And we'll certainly lean on you for help in those areas. I, I would, you know, kind of put the call out to everyone in cigar media to help, uh, you know, spread the word and get the word out there that um, about what our industry is really about and help change that perception that people have. Yeah. On, on on tobacco and in how cigars are different. All the things that Glenn has said when he comes on the show about how you've educated people on the hill, Glenn. I feel like we need to take that message now and get it out to as a wide of audience as we can, so that people aren't ignorant to all things tobacco and not lumping everything together like cigarettes, hookah, e-cigarettes, and cigars all into one big category of bad. No one should ever do them, and their industry should die and start dissecting it and having more intelligent discussions. And, and I'll add another thing, you know, in, in terms of what we're reporting, there's a lot of stuff that's out there, but, you know, a lot of it really doesn't, it's not aimed at the cigar industry per se. And, yeah. you know, it, like we always talked about smoking a cigar outside a courthouse. I'm not sure if that's something we want to, there's not a lot of people who smoke a cigar outside a, 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 a county courthouse. I don't think that's where we want to be putting our energy. It's the stuff we've been talking about right. um, that we, I think our energies need to be put towards. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Uh, it was a couple of years ago, a member of the, um, of the House in the uh, Oregon legislature put in a bill because apparently everything there in that state is under the domain of smoke shop. And she put in a bill that said a smoke shop can have no more than four chairs or was I trying to find my hands on the screen? No more than four chairs in a smoke shop. And we're like, well, what the heck does this do to cigar shops? And I've, I've been in some great cigar shops in, in Portland, for example, at Broadway. And you got these wonderful lounges. And, and what is it? Most cigar shops you go into, you can fit maybe a dozen guys into, mm. ladies into. And we're like, what is the impetus for this piece of legislation? A smoke shop can't have more than four chairs. Well, her target was hookah. And when she was asked, she was like, hookah is reigning in young people. And this is our effort to prevent young people from getting hooked on hookah. And we're like, well, what the hell does that have to do with cigar shops? <laughs> and it, it just kind of dramatized. We are collateral damage on so many yeah. fronts. Whether it's on the tax front, we'll get pulled into a roll your own fight. Yeah, I don't, I don't understand the the hookah thing either, Glenn. Like, it, what does the, the woman from Oregon think that, well, kids are going into hookah lounges and then they're getting hooked on tobacco? Like, I don't look as okay. hookah. It don't even look as hookah as that, right? We get, we get pulled into roll your own fights. Mm. We get pulled into hookah fights. We've been pulled into smokeless tobacco fights. Just because it's under this giant domain of tobacco. OTP, yeah. And I think that's been the brilliance of having legislation that says, let's define what a premium cigar is. Mm. And, you know, and if you define what a premium cigar is by statute, in the same fashion that the federal government defines bourbon by federal statute, perhaps that could lead to not only different regulatory treatment, but different tax treatment. Right. Yep. And that, it's, I don't know, that seems somewhat unique, right? Um when we talk about the different types of tobacco and having them being treated differently, when we look at other regulations, you know, they lump a lot of different things together. But when you start lumping those things together, they're so different. Like there's not a lot of like, parallels to other, you know, yeah. industries or situations where you got to treat the individual businesses that are underneath tobacco and individual industries, I should say, uh, differently because it's a totally different model when you go from cigars to cigarettes to hookah to uh, to vaping, I the, think. Yeah, and the average, I mean, I can tell you there's a lot of people who, who will think a cigar is just a big cigarette. Right, exactly. And it's, and it's totally, when you when you start talking, and I, and I know because I've spoken to people on other functions outside the show, and they when you when you tell them the whole story behind it, their, their eyes actually start to light up, and yeah. wow, this really isn't a, a big cigarette. Right. Yeah. Glenn, well, go ahead, Glenn. 
No, I was I was looking around my office for my copy, and I can't find. I'll, I'll pull it out. I was gonna do a dramatic visual aid, but to dramatize your point, if you read the deeming regulation that the FDA has put onto us, and it may well be in the final rule, we don't know. But if you read that document that was put out on on April twenty fifth, two thousand fourteen. There is clearly an effort on behalf of the FDA and the public health community as a whole to say that there's absolutely no difference between this and a pack of cigarettes. Hmm. They clearly are trying to make that case through very nebulous science, very questionable science, very, you know, reports that have been generated far and wide with really little validity to them, that there is nothing, that there's no difference between this and and a pack of cigarettes. And the public health community heart, lung, cancer, campaign for tobacco-free kids, etc., have all gone to great, great pains to paint that picture. And it's up to us to refute that. I mean, we've done over uh, six briefings for the Food and Drug Administration uh, since this debate began. We've done numerous presentations to the White House Office of Management Budget. We've submitted quantifiable evidence uh, from from true authorities in the arena as to why this is different. Um but again, we've had to concentrate on messaging there, and and maybe this show has, serves as a catalyst for this. Is is it's really time to take that to the mainstream public? Good point. You know, and and you know, you talk about the deeming regulations that was sent to the OMB. Um, eleven eleven U.S. senators came out. They they're, they're starting to put pressure on the OMB to push this through. And the reason they gave, it was right back to this kids argument again, which I kind of just was yawning in a way even though I'm taking it seriously, saying, we're back to this again? I mean, has anything registered that this is not a product for children? It just, it's almost like it's been pushed aside. Well, I'll, I won't disclose the name of the Senate office I was in about a year ago on this very subject. Uh, but I pulled out a very, very inexpensive mass market product. And I pulled out a very, very expensive cigar and one i think this all comes down to enforcement and we should talk more about that <coughs> but the staff member looked down at the expensive cigar and i said you know america's children are not buying this product and she looked at me with the straightest face this could be and said but they could and i just i get this stone cold dramatic pause you know in front of her, and I'm just mind boggled by the attitude and the perception of some people that America's kids can walk in. And in fact, I think there was a there was a uh, part of the focus groups they called it when the FDA was developing the deeming reg, where they documented documented. Don't ask me how that uh, somebody underage bought a fifty dollar cigar, mm-hmm. and I'm like thinking to myself. Yeah, 17, 18 years of running around in, in cigar shops across the country, seven years of CR going into hundreds of cigar shops. You don't see kids in these shops. You don't see children trying to buy cigars of, of any price range. You don't. They don't even get through the front door. Uh, again, I keep going back to the word fiction. Mm. You know, um, Kevin Page of Butthead Cigars is a good friend of mine. Um, I went into a store a couple years ago. And um, I bought some cigars. And he's located in Danbury, Connecticut. And, they, and Kevin wasn't there at the time, so the person working behind the counter asked for my ID. I gave him my ID. So an hour later, I was talking to Kevin, and he sold me on some more cigars. So I went up to the register to pay for the cigars, and um, Kevin asked for my ID. And I, I kind of joked. I said, oh, I gave it to so-and-so a little earlier. He goes, no. He goes, well, you don't understand. He goes, I can't open the register without – having your driver's license in there. What a great story. And hmm. I hate to mandate certain things, saying, but the, the technology's totally there. He, to, to, to fix this problem, it's a fixable problem. It's a fixable problem. It's You're a right, fixable well. problem. It really is. And then they yep. don't, you know, if, that's what my point is. So I, I understood. I, I never realized that existed until he told me that. that. I did not know the technology existed to not open a register. Yep. Where you've carded, that's that's intriguing as I'll get out. Well, yeah, most, most licenses have barcodes now. Yeah, no, that's not to say people still can't generate fake IDs, but no, but I mean it's harder because now there's um to to kind of swipe that thing, and that's right. what he does. To, to generate a fake swiper is a lot more difficult. 
a 16 uh, year old kid's yeah. not going to have that uh, type of well uh, you think i educate hackers for a living so yeah i mean it's not it, to go through that much trouble to buy a cigar is like is like glenn is saying is probably pretty much fiction at that point it, right? it, it, yeah, yeah. It, it, but but yeah to buy alcohol i could totally yeah i could totally see i don't know if that sparks any any debate from your side glenn uh that kids are probably more likely to buy alcohol than they are cigars well, can we uh, switch gears a little bit? I, yeah. I just generated a report um, that we're going to be uh, distributing to the White House Office of Management and Budget. Uh, we just got confirmation yesterday that uh, in light of the receipt of the final rule by OMB, which occurred on October the 19th, um, that we're in that next stage part of the process. And we're going to be going into White House OMB on Tuesday, November the 17th. And I'll talk about the meeting that we're having the next day in just a moment. But to prepare for that meeting, uh, and just this morning we wrapped up, it, we've been working on it really for the last three, four, five days, generate a report that kind of puts in a synopsis format everything that's happened uh, in the course of, of the last several years, beginning really with April 15th, 2011, was the day that the original, our original, the traditional Cigar Manufacturing and Small Business Jobs Preservation Act was introduced in Congress, which the significance of that truly was it's the first time the premium cigar industry went on political offense and said, listen, we've got to do something different politically. Uh, we're going to use the Congress to our advantage. We're going to build a coalition that supports this industry. So that's three sessions of Congress now, the 112th, 113th, and now we're in the 114th session of Congress. And in the course of time, since April 15th, 2011, 283, I got my notes beside me, so forget my glancing over, uh, 283 members of the House of Representatives have signed on to that legislation at one time or another. Obviously, we've had some election cycles during the course of that period of time, so there's been turnover. There's been people that did not return to Congress, uh, people that didn't sign back on for one reason or another. And if you want to chat about that, we can. But at one time or another, since April 15, 2011, 283 members of Congress. That's an amazing commentary. What's even more amazing is that of that 283, 73 of them voted for the original Tobacco Control Act. 73 members of Congress voted for that original Tobacco Control Act, which told the FDA to regulate cigarettes and smokeless, but did not specifically name cigars without having to go through the uh, deeming process, which obviously we're in the throngs of now. Uh, 26 members of the United States Senate have signed on to that same legislation at one time or another since 2011 that had been spearheaded really by, by Senator Bill Nelson and, and Marco Rubio of, of Florida, uh, Bob Casey and, and Pat Toomey of Pennsylvania. Uh, as two states that are cornerstone economic foundation states for the premium cigar industry. Uh, but that's an amazing commentary on political coalition building. Um, during that same period of time, and I'm just going to reel off the number of committees that have been briefed, that have been acclimated to the premium cigar industry since this period of time. In the House of Representatives, the Appropriations Committee, the Foreign Affairs Committee, the Energy and Commerce Committee, Oversight and Government Reform Committee, and the Small Business Committee. In the the Senate, the Committee on Foreign Relations, Appropriations, and Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, as well as small business, have all been introduced to our issue and educated as to what regulating this industry is all about. You'll notice a common denominator between those two are not only the appropriations committees that we would need to get our language through in some form or fashion, and in fact have passed language that is beckoning, doesn't mandate, but beckons the FDA to treat us differently, is, is the Foreign Affairs Committees. And that's something I wanted to chat about on the, on the show a bit today, is that, uh, hold this up, I don't know if you can see this there, this is a letter that was jointly signed by the ambassadors to the United States from Honduras, Nicaragua, and the Dominican Republic that, have been, that has been sent to key agencies throughout the President's administration, uh, namely the State Department, the FDA, the Small Business Administration, Commerce, Agriculture. But they also took it a step further and sent it to the National Security Council because it goes back to your uh, original statement about what it means in Latin America. This letter documents over 300,000 jobs in those three countries associated with the premium cigar industry. 
And I want to read just one sentence from this that I think is absolutely key. This is from the ambassadors to the agencies, and they also sent it to the House and Senate Foreign Affairs and Foreign Relations Committees. Quote, no regulatory measure should threaten such jobs and hence raise the specter of political and economic consequences within our region. That's a powerful statement in a very politically, very politically sensitive region within this hemisphere. So I, I think this this is the type of messaging that allows us to truly make the case of how distinctive we are. And the fact that these three ambassadors came together and signed this joint letter to all these federal agencies under the president's domain and to the Congress is an amazing commentary on where we have come as a political force in this country uh, in a very, very short period of time. You know, and that's a good point. Let me let me kind of ask another question in regards to that. And I don't if I'm taking it off tangent, let me know. But what about you know now? There's all this talk about Cuba. How does how does that all fit into this? You know, it's kind of a, there's an irony, so to speak, that you know we're we're opening up Cuba for economic development. Um, and you know, cigars are a big part of the Cuban industry. There's jobs down there. How is that? It kind of almost feels like it's hypocritical there. Well, I'm glad you brought it up in this context, because obviously the phone started to ring off the hook after the president made his announcement in December uh, that he was going to do what he could from an executive order perspective to normalize diplomatic relations with, with Cuba. And few subjects are, are obviously as sensitive within the premium cigar industry as, as that. And we've been very candid. There should not be discussions and talk about uh, diplomatic and economic uh, opening up of relations until there's been a tangible discussion about providing uh, freedom and civil liberties for the people of Cuba. So we've been very public in that. And we've also said publicly that, that the Congress should fully vet this entire subject through appropriate hearings uh, before efforts move forward. Well, obviously the president uh, is... I'm not going to say push the envelope, but done what he thinks he can do through executive orders to push that agenda item of his down the road. Mm -hmm. And obviously it culminated with the Secretary of State uh, raising the American flag and the, both countries opening up and declaring embassies instead of interest sections within their respective countries. With that, our argument has become that once the State Department said you can bring back $100 worth of cigars and rum, cigars and alcohol, back into this country, I don't care then at that point if it's $100 worth of cigars or a million dollars worth of cigars. Once you state that an American citizen can bring that product back into this country, in our opinion, my opinion at least, you have to subject Havana cigar factories just to the exact same regulations as you would our, our brethren in Honduras, Nicaragua, yeah. and the Dominican Republic. I don't think politically that's something that the administration has either considered or, or thought about or put into the discussion mix, given that what cigars mean to that country's economy. And we intend to take that message far and wide. We intend to talk to members of Congress that are proponents of normalization of trade and diplomatic relations with Cuba, that that's a factor and ought to be considered. Uh, and we're going to take that message to the State Department. And we're going to do it next month. And we're going to put in the mix that, that you have to consider that as a, uh, as a factor in these discussions and how that relates to the message you're sending to the rest of Latin America, that you're going to subject these companies in those three countries to these regulations, but you're not going to do it to Havana. I don't think that's a good that you're going to sell legally or politically. And so it makes for a very, very intriguing dynamic that has just presented itself since the president made his announcement. Interesting. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. Um, we're running a little short on time. I got my start times and end times mixed we, up. We fell behind somehow. I don't know yeah, what happened. We, well, because I was looking at the end time and not the start Me time. Too. I think that's probably <laughs> what happened, yeah. <laughs> so um, do we have time for trivia? How long is trivia going to take? Uh, we, we got 1240 is the next segment. All right. So, Glenn... We're going to run through trivia. Are you ready to play 20 questions with the Stoey Geeks? No. <laughs> <laughs> In honor of cigar rights, are you willing to play 20 questions with the Stoey Geeks? It's multiple choice, Glenn. I could have been warned about this. 
Jesus. <laughs> but that would have taken away all of our fun. Yeah, I just found out about it yesterday. <laughs> All right, is Glenn, this like you're... Abe's? Are you smarter than a stripper? I well, gotta be like, you know, no, that's that's that's. I gotta the be other smarter show. than a pimp. You're told, we're, we're not going to give you the answers. We're going to give the answers at the end of the show. Um, but I will give you your score at the end. Yeah. Dave Burke scored a 45 percent. Will scored an 85 percent. So that that's where the bar has been set. So are you ready? <laughs> oh God! All right. When did Connecticut Broadleaf first appear in the cigar market? Was it A the 1920s? B, the 1820s, C, the 1950s, or D, the last time Will had hair? <laughs> Say, give me the top options again. Uh, 1920s, 1820s, 1950s, or the last time Will had hair? I'll say 1920s. Okay. Uh, the phrase, close but no cigar, originated from Bill Clinton's presidency, a cigar being a popular carnival game prize, Hollywood movies, or what the FDA has been saying for the past few years? Give me the top two again. Um, Bill Clinton's presidency, a popular prize at carnivals in the past. Hollywood movies, or what the FDA has been saying? I'll say carnivals. Okay. Fidel Castro got his own brand in 1966, which was called A. Monte Cristo, B, Castro's Cigars, C, Cohiba, or D, Partagas? Cohiba. Where does the term stogie come from? A, George Burns invented it. B, Cuba. C, it's Spanish for cigar. Or D, Pennsylvania manufacturers who used conestogas or covered wagons. I'll guess the Pennsylvania one. A thousand tobacco seeds can fit inside of what? A, a pint glass. B, nestled in my chest hair. C, a thimble. Or D, a 55-gallon drum. Thimble. What does hecho a mano mean? A, man hands. B, handmade. C, manly man. Or D, Hector's man? I guess handmade. The Cuban embargo banning the importation of cigars and other goods from Cuba was put into effect in which year? A, 1962, B, 1961, C, 1960, or D, 1992? 62. Okay. The first successful commercial crop in the U.S. was cultivated in 1612 in which state? A, Connecticut, B, Rhode Island, C, Virginia, or D, Pennsylvania? Virginia. I'm going to say he got that one right. If he was going to get that one wrong, yeah. oh, I'm in trouble. I just gave it away. <laughs> one percent. Great. Give it away my answer as well. <laughs> in 1994, the Cuban government created this organization to handle the global distribution and marketing of Cuban cigars. A, General Cigars. B, Cohiba. C, Habanos S.A. Or D, Swedish Match. Habanos S.A. All right. Now we're going to move on to the topic of cigar plants. This category is a little more difficult, Glenn. I didn't get through Tobacco's University, kids. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're gonna, you know, the, I think the lowest score we're gonna send you the the, the book, but I think you're doing you're doing good so far. You're yeah, very yeah. good. Cigar tobacco plants require how many hours of sunlight per day? Is it A four, B six, C eight, or D ten? I'll guess six. The lowest priming of a tobacco plant is called what? A, Lajero, B, Viso, C, Seiko, or D, Volado? Oh, uh, Armateris is going to kick my rear for this. <laughs> <laughs> Viso. <laughs> okay. Here. A cured tobacco leaf is brown because what has been replaced by carotene? Is it A, chlorophyll? B, cholesterol, C, caloric acid, or D, pigment? I was goofing off pulling out my tobacconist handbook, so repeat that one. Okay, so the cured tobacco leaf is brown because what has been replaced by carotene? Is it chlorophyll, cholesterol, caloric acid, or pigment? Chlorophyll. 
What is the country of origin of the Cameroon rapper? Is it A, Nicaragua, B, Indonesia, C, Cameroon, or D, Ecuador? Cameroon comes from Cameroon. To create a Maduro wrapper, you need what? A, a Maduro seed plant, B, to use the right fermentation process, C, a Maduro priming, or D, black paint? <laughs> Maduro primer. I mean, what what what'd you say before that? Um, the to use the right fermentation process or a Maduro seed plant. No. Give me the options again. A Maduro seed plant. To use the right fermentation process. Fermentation process. In the topmost priming of a tobacco plant is called what? Is it A, Corona, B, Lajero, C, Viso, or D, Volado? Oh, God. I'll say Lajero. It's probably wrong. <laughs> this type of plant was developed in the 1930s by Diego Rodriguez, named after its birthplace, Voleta Abuejo region. It, is the, it was the premier wrapper for Cuban cigars until the 1990s. Is it A, Habano? B, Criollo, C, Corojo, or D, Piloto Cubano? I'll say Criollo. Primarily used for filler, this Dominican plant derives part of its name from the Spanish word for aroma. Is it A, Piloto Cubano, B, Olor Dominicano, C, San Vicente, or D, Cibao Valley? On that one. Uh, I'll say the first A, hey, whatever the first one was. Okay. It's like the way I took my SAT question. <laughs> Picked or primed tobacco leaves are hung in barns, also known as Casas de Tabac, for approximately how many days before moving on to the next stage? Is it A, 30 days, B, 7 days, C, 50 days, or D, 60 days? I'll guess 60. In the first phase of fermentation, leaves are bunched together in gavilas, or bunches of five or more leaves, then laid in short piles about one to three feet tall, which are called A, burrows, B, pilones, C, piles, or D, mounds. What were the first two? Uh, burrows or pilones. I'll say pilones, even though it's probably wrong. This is another SAT question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hold on. I'm going to calculate your score. Oh, for the love of God. <laughs> Carry to one. You got a 60% score, Glenn. Oh, so okay. You, I can live with that. You're ahead of Dave Burke, but still behind William Cooper, so you're, in fact, not in last place. So that's good. <laughs> that's good. God. I, you did much better on the cigar history. Read this, um, children. Read it. <laughs> yes. You got you got well, the cigar history. You did well. I won't tell you how many got you on the cigar history, but you did really well in the cigar yeah. history. You need to study your tobacco yeah, university. Well, yeah, you got your book there. Yeah, you so got your book. Yeah. Read chapter Put one. that in the bathroom. That's great one, bathroom yeah. reading. Glenn. After you're reading those that was, deeming that documents. That was just cool, and I'm going to cuss you the rest of the day for this. <laughs> <laughs> It's better than reading those deeming documents. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, ask me what's on page 42 of that. Then I'm there you go. Out. There you go. We weren't in your exact area of expertise. No, Glenn, you did great. Thank you very much for Thanks, playing. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you very much. Everyone support CRA, CRA, uh, cigarrights.org. Go there and uh, get a membership today or renew. Use the code 015. 015959. Five yep. And okay. I will send you an additional cigar uh, on top of if you sign up. And if you renew, I'll also send you an additional cigar. There you go. Thank you very much. And listen, real quick, I'll give a little plug that we're going to roll this out in the next, uh, hopefully, couple of weeks. Is We're going to start offering, we're going to run a promotional where you can get this book, The Ultimate Cigar Book by Richard Hacker, uh, fourth edition. Uh, we're going to be offering that for a two-year membership for, I think, a uh, two-year membership for $65. We'll mail you this book uh, as as our gift, so we're getting more like the uh, national you know public television in terms of offering premiums for membership and the like. So look for that promotion will be coming real soon. Cool. Excellent. Yep. Thanks so much, Glenn. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Appreciate your help. Take care. Take care. With that, we take a short break. Come back with uh, Mr. John Carney yep. from the Florida Dominicana. Very nice. 